This is Rabbi Neet Leah Sarna and Rabbi David Wolkenfeld. Shalom and welcome to the Straw Hat. We are the official podcast of An Shri Shalom B'nai Israel Congregation, an Orthodox synagogue in Chicago, Illinois. This episode, we will have three parts for you. First, we'll have a discussion about Hanukkah, an upcoming holiday you might have heard of, uh, with Rabbi Neet Sarah Walkenfeld, who's joining us in Shlensky Studios today. Second, we'll have a discussion about Daf Yomi. The new cycle is coming up very soon. And lastly, we'll have an interview with Carolyn Musenberkowitz, one of the many Daf Yomi learners of our show about her experiences learning Daf Yomi. Hope you enjoy. We are here today with Sarah Walkenfeld to share a little bit about some research that uh, she's done into Hanukkah. This is a in preparation for a shiur that she is giving uh, in, in New York City, but lots of Hanukkah ideas have been floating around her house for a, a number of days as these sources have come together, as the ideas have come together, and uh, I uh, was really excited by the possibility of sharing these ideas, not just with your live audience in New York, but also with uh, the podcast uh, audience as well. I think the interesting piece that I read that kind of kicked me off thinking that I wanted to research Pursume Nisa more was an essay. What's uh, Pursume Nisa? Oh, Pursume Nisa means publicizing the miracle. Good call, Arvind Sarna. Uh, <laughs> Pursume Nisa means publicizing the miracle of Hanukkah. And you you might be familiar with this idea of publicizing the miracle from such other phenomenal holidays as Purim, mm. when we publicize the miracle of being saved from imminent demise at the hands of Haman. Or Passover, when we publicize the miracle of having been taken out of Egypt. And over Shabbat, I was reading an essay by Rav Hutner, by Yitzhak Hutner, who wrote a, an amazing work called Pachad Yitzhak. He has these long drashot. If either Rabbinit Sarna or Rabbi Walkenfeld were to deliver these drashot on Shabbat, we would be in shul for a while as he works his way through the ideas, but they're really fascinating. And in writing about this idea of publicizing the miracle, he points out something that I felt sort of should have been obvious to me, that Hanukkah is really the outlier in this Pirsume Nisa triad, because on Purim, it's pretty obvious there was a miracle. And in order to make that miracle known, we tell the story of Esther. We tell the story of Mordechai. We tell what happened. And on Passover as well, there is a story. And we tell that story over the course of the night, over the course of our Seder. Hanukkah has a story. Hanukkah arguably even has more than one story. But there is no ritualized telling of the story on Hanukkah. And instead, what we do largely to publicize the miracle, the, the halachic piece that's identified with that Pirsume Nisa activity, is lighting the Hanukkah candles. You know what's interesting? I think we do ritualize the telling of it in Al Hanisim. We do, but, but it's, it's not, not linked to the, of the exactly. public activity. Like it's actually, a, well, except for the Chazar Rashat, it's a private activity. Yeah. Tosfot in, uh, in the Gemara in Shabbat that talks about publicizing the miracle mentions actually the, the Haftorah that we read mm. in Shul. That, um, that we read about Zechariah, we read about the Menorah. So there's a tie in, and mm-hmm. he calls that the Pirsume Nisa of Hanukkah. But again, Mm, right? It's not the Hanukkah story that we were all raised with. Well, it's like he's just sort of animated by a parallel, I guess, to Nicolette Esther. If we're reading something in Shul, right. like that's how we do Pursuing Nisa. Hanukkah has to be... And it's so funny because we actually do read stuff in Shul every day of Hanukkah. But it's not, not about right. Hanukkah. <laughs> right. Yeah, Tosfot addresses that a little bit also. I thought it was a good line. He says something like, Torah reading is like not such good Pursu Minisa anyway. Like, <laughs> well, he knows how many people come to our daily minyan. <laughs> sort of sounds like that wouldn't work out so well anyway. But wow. but the Haftarah is one version. So yeah, I think we do have ways. And you could say that Hanerot Halalu, the song that some people sing after lighting candles. But there's nothing... It's more halacha than anything else. Yeah, right. There's nothing that's really really retells the story that's linked to the lighting of the candles. Except for, I guess, Maus Tzor, sort of. Sort one of. paragraph of. <laughs> right, right. Related, but but yeah. I think still not reaching Megillah Esther or Haggadah Shal Pesach levels mm-hmm. of retelling. We totally. definitely don't have that. And going along with that, I think the other part of that question is then, so who's the audience? Because on Purim, we gather together for reading Megillah. There's a question of whether you need there to be 10 people present. And it's certainly clear that it's it's ideal for there to be a tzibor, for there to be 10 people present. Um, and you, you have presumably a built-in audience the Seder, again, ideally, you're sitting around the table with other people. 
when it comes to lighting Hanukkah candles, we have this idea that we should publicize it, but no set, no no very clear idea about how many people have to see it, who has to see it, what's the forum for that. So those are the questions that I think are really interesting about publicizing the Hanukkah miracle. So what are some of the possibilities of like who the audience is for, I mean, by if you're lighting in the window, so it's passersby, right? Or... Yeah, so we do have this idea that the zman, the correct time for lighting Hanukkah candles, is from the time that the sun sets, until there's no more people walking around through the marketplace, until there's no more people walking through the streets. The complicated part about that is to think about whether that's a, a timeline that was set up in the Talmud, and we should just sort of stick to that timeline, whatever, however that translates into specific times in our day, or whether we should be attentive or how much we should be attentive to people actually walking by. You, know, you and I live on Buckingham, <laughs> very close to the corner of Halstead. Halstead is a happening place till quite late at night. Um, I think so quite early in the morning. So <laughs> quite early in the morning. Uh, right now we're speaking in the shul. We're on Melrose. It's a much quieter street. There's really not much going on here, I think, at midnight. Mm -hmm. So how much should we be careful about that to make sure that there's really and an then also out there. if you're on a lakeshore drive high rise and let's say you have a beautiful lake view or not and you lay it in the window like nobody's seeing what, the that, sea right? creatures in the lake are gonna <laughs> see or for some anisa <laughs> right so it's not clear and and the the tama just mentions that you can light privately in a time of sakana in a time where it's dangerous for the candles to be seen but already by the time of the commentaries on the Talmud, you see a reality reflected that, yeah, they thought it was pretty unrealistic by and large to light outside. I don't know how dangerous it was exactly, but they sort of call it sakana, they call it danger, and they were lighting inside. And so you get all these modern conversations. I think Rabbi Vadi Yosef, who was the former chief Sephardic rabbi of Israel, says if you get home late at night, nobody's awake nobody's outside. You should try to like wake some people in your household oh, to watch yeah. you light Hanukkah candles. And he says something like, but if they really won't wake up, then you light just for yourself. Oh, so the audience is you. You're publicizing the miracle to yourself. To yourself. The eternal... Yeah. Then the audience is you. And it seems like even though there is this Pirasume Nisa piece, even though there is this belief that it's really core to the mitzvah to publicize it to other people, I think that by and large, the halachic decisors were reluctant to give up on the idea that you would at the very least light for yourself, that you would have at the very least, publicize the miracle to yourself. Another interesting implication of this question of who needs to hear about the miracle, who needs to see the light that publicizes the miracle, is the question of lighting Hanukkah candles in shul. It's a custom to light Hanukkah candles in shul. It's not the core mitzvah. The core mitzvah is to light in your home, in your house, by yourself, or with your family, with whoever you're with on Hanukkah. It's also an ancient custom to have like a light up Hanukkah menorah outside of your shul built into the building <laughs> that you use once a year, right? Totally. That's very important. It also. goes back to Mary and Paul, our ancestors. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Yes. Before electricity, they had these also. Right. Yeah. 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 Okay. Good. Um, and we're going to keep that custom. But um, yeah. <laughs> but it's also customary to light actually in, in the Beit HaKnesset in shul. And, uh, and then the question becomes, well, who needs to be present to witness that lighting? So there's a famous idea in a book called Hare Kedem that it's important to light when there's a, a quorum present and, and specifically that you should light the Hanukkah candles before all of the tefillot have been said. So for example, if you're saying tefillot marav, you're the end of that service, the end of the evening service is aleinu. So before aleinu, you should light Hanukkah candles. And the reason is because at that point, those people who are in the room together, let's say 15 people in the room together on a good day, right? On a good <laughs> night. Let's say those 15 people, they are at that moment a tzibor. They are a community, a congregation in every sense of the term because they are on a mission. They have tefillah ahead of them. Their mission was to dav and marv, and they haven't completed that mission until that last tefillah. So they're bound together. They have shem tzibor. They, they are called a congregation because they haven't finished praying yet. And it's important to light at that moment. And I was very interested in this question of when do we say that the people present in shul have this Shem Tzibor, considered a community. There's a modern work of halacha that everyone can check out online if they want to. It's called Pnine Halacha. Do we have some of the volumes in the shul? We do, yeah. We do. We have some of them. So they're... Most of the ones that have been translated to English, we own in shul. 
the Hebrew, I think, is all online, right? So the Hebrew is all online, and the ones that are translated online. are online, too, I think. Yeah. yeah. So this one I didn't find in English online, but uh, it's Rabbi Malamed. And in writing about this issue and writing about Hilchot Hanukkah, he says specifically that when 10 people are in shul, they qualify as a quorum for the purpose of lighting Hanukkah candles. So you don't necessarily have 10 men present, which is how we count a minion at ASBI, but you have 10 people present. Those 10 people are a quorum for the purposes of Pirsu Nisa. They have that Shem Tzibor. They have that name of the congregation on them. And so we should light Hanukkah candles, make the blessing on Hanukkah candles when they are present. And I assume we will proceed accordingly here at ASBI. <laughs> Though we'll always have a minion, of course. We'll always have Obviously. Minion. 30 people every night. But, and uh, what, about, <laughs> what about if you're, like, for example, we're going to do a candle lighting at Windy City, um, and there might be 10 adult Jews there, but there might not because there's a lot of kids who come. But there will probably also be non-Jews there. Do non-Jews count as part of the Sibor audience, audience for Bruce and Isla and in this kind of situation? Yeah, I'm really interested in that question also. There is definitely a position that says yes. Mm-hmm. Um, it starts actually with Rashi because the when the Talmud, I think this is just kind of a weird, interesting like fact that the, when the Talmud talks about uh, the people who would be in the shuk late at night, the people who would be mm-hmm. out in the marketplace. So who yeah. were the last to leave the, the marketplace? The stick collectors. The stick collectors, the Tarmudai. And Rashi says that they are a nation of stick collectors. And they were uh, they were out there in the shuk last of all. Um, and he specifically implies that they were not not Jewish. And yet, you can continue to publicize the miracle as long as they are out and about in the shuk. And Rav Soloveitchik writes about this and, and sort of infers that publicizing Hanukkah is actually universal and not limited to Jews. So I think on that basis, we will certainly do a lot of Pirsi Menisa in our windy city lighting as people walk by those, yeah. those windows. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks for coming in. Thanks, guys. So there's a every seven and a half years event in the Jewish calendar coming up in just a few short weeks. Delayed Hakel? <laughs> yes, delayed Hakel. Something like that. Um, no, it's the Siyum Hashas for Daf Yomi. Very exciting. Very, very exciting. Um, so can you say, say a little bit about why this is so exciting? Yeah. Oh, well, first of all, it only happens every seven and a half years. Sometimes people ask, like, how big is the Talmud? And I think the best answer to that is if you studied a folio a day every day, it would take you seven and a half years to finish it. Like, I think that's actually like the best way to understand how truly enormous the Talmud is. And uh, and it helps you to understand also why so many like uh, commentators over time or codifiers over time have felt like this is too much. People can't live based on this document. Like, we have to figure out how to do it differently. Um, and that's that gives rise to the riff and the Rambam and whatever. Anyways, it's exciting because also so many people have engaged in this massive project book club that is Daphne and me and, and are, are completing a cycle, which is just a huge learning accomplishment as well for those people. So let, let's go back to the beginning. What is Daphne Yomi and, and when did it develop? And, and say more about that. Yeah, well, you're really the historian, so maybe you should say more about that. <laughs> okay. In 1923, uh, Ramir Shapiro was, uh, was a uh, Rosh Hashiva in Poland, uh, presented this idea at the um, International Convention of Agudat Yisrael. I think the Agudah was formed in 1921 and tried to unite under one banner all of the various Orthodox segments uh, or the segments of European Orthodoxy under one in one aguda, one one bundle, one bundle, grouping yeah. uh, together uh, to, you know, I guess fight what they saw as threats to orthodoxy, which they identified as uh, things like uh, Zionism and secularism and religious reform. Uh, so actually, did not include the religious Zionists, uh, but they did include a big <laughs> at the time a fairly big, uh, you know, um, grouping of orthodox and, and actually the really fiercest anti-Zionists also felt that the aguda was too compromising. Uh, mm-hmm. In its anti-Zionism, so so it, even from the outset in the Not early twentieth century, enough. yeah, I mean yeah. the Minchas Elazar has has uh, the Munkacher Rebbe has has uh, fierce fierce denunciations of the Aguda mm-hmm. for their uh, and indeed if you want to like you know the famous uh, people talk about the status quo agreement you know that that <laughs> that ensconced a certain role for the um, rabbinate in the state of Israel that status quo agreement was made between Ben Gurion and representatives of the Aguda, uh, which for which they were castigated by their Right wing out there. Anyway, I digress. <laughs> anyway, so 1923. <laughs> he has this, this idea. Let's let's um, create this synchronized study of a page, a daf, a folio, a double sided page of Talmud every day, and 
there will be two things we'll accomplish. One, the more obscure, less studied Masechtot and Prakim chapters and, and tractates of the Talmud will, at least every seven and a half years, people will see them and engage with them. And second, it can unite Jews all over the world. And the example he gave when he presented this proposal was a Jew gets on a steamship in Europe and spends two weeks traveling to America. And all the while, he's studying his Talmud every day. And he arrives at a port in New York and goes into a shtivel and he finds everyone there also. And the base Medrash is also learning the same. They're on this exact same page he's on. And so he can immediately um, find a chevra and, and have that Torah conversation. And, and, and that's, you know, if that was true in 1923 with, uh, you know, the pre-modern, uh, or not pre-modern, but the earlier stage of uh, communication technology. And, they were writing and, it on the walls of caves. <laughs> yes. No, they were, they could telegraph, you know, they had telegraphs and, and radios and they had, you know, uh, but uh, they, you know, even the more so now with, with podcasting and with streaming and, and mm-hmm. with, um, and people who, uh, you know, jet travel, et cetera. So even the more so it can unite people around the world. And that's really been, um, I think what's part of it been so exciting about Dafyomi, I think it's, it has, you know, exposed people to obscure parts of the Talmud that had, that are not on the yeshiva curriculum. It's also sure. united people all over the world that you can, if you're in the Dafyomi, you can walk up to someone else in the shul or in a different shul or and say, oh, today's daf, really amazing. And yes, indeed, ha, 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 you know, or or uh, really confounding the daf. And there are, there are internet uh, discussion groups and, and podcasts and there are, you know, blogs where people write poems about the daily daf. And it's a real, like, international conversation all surrounding Torah that, uh, that that's sort of this synchronous synchronized study makes possible. Now, it, and you could say the original, like, synchronized study of Torah is the uh, the weekly Torah portion, right? Which also has kind of the same, like, you can go yeah, to a yeah, Jew yeah. anywhere in the world and say, ah, you know, really exciting about, you know, this week's Torah portion. And that that's that, that's certainly true, and it doesn't function that way. I think... Um, Somehow people feel much more sophisticated about themselves <laughs> when they, like, talk about the daf than when they're like, oh, like, I was reading a Rashi this week, yeah. which is kind of chaval, actually. Look, I think, I think it's certainly true that the Torah, weekly Torah portion, I think Lubavitcher Rebbe said, like, the... You know, I think he wants to find that the news of the week is that week's Parsha. Okay. It's like, what's yeah. topical? Like, what's like on our community agenda each week? It's like the themes and the topics and the stories and the mitzvot that occur in that week's Parsha. So I think that's, that, that's definitely true in terms of how we, the different Torah we share, the assumption you can assume that other people are thinking about these same ideas that emerge. That's definitely true. We sort of have that assumption when we talk about Parsha things on the podcast, but, mm-hmm. um, Daf, I think it's a little more granular. Like each day has one Daf and it's mm-hmm. a little bit more, um, it's a more rigorous uh, task to like to study it, even in a very superficial w- way. You're talking at least 20 minutes, maybe 40 minutes to an hour, and that's just much more uh, rigorous and robust a kind of learning project than just to like re- read through the parsha over the course of a week. Yeah, so let's talk about that superficiality for a second. So there's two there's two kind of main orientations towards or methods of study that we talk about when we talk about Torah study and they're called uh, Be'yun and Be'kiyut. I wouldn't even call them methods. I'd call them genres of study. Genres? Okay, fine. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's okay. Genres of study. Let's go with that. Um, so Ian is what typically takes up your time in a yeshiva. If you're going to sit three hours a day, you're going to earn six hours a day or whatever it is. Um, that is when you have enough time to study Ian. And Ian would take three lines of the Talmud and then every, every round every toast vote, every rush, every riff, every um, all of the, cl- every Rambam for sure. I mean, I guess at least where I come from, every Rambam for sure. And then the, what the point, so you're sitting in yeshiva with your chavruta, you're preparing all of those sources and maybe up through modern stuff also. And then the point of the Magid Shir, like the reason why you would then go to class is not because you don't understand what those sources mean. Of course you understand what they mean, but because the person who's going to then teach the class has some beautiful idea about those three lines of Talmud constructed based on the way they've been interpreted through history that um, kind of gives you some philosophical underpinning um, to it or, or cuts into some some deep debate about the essence of the mitzvah under discussion. Or explains some halachic debate and how the Talmudic passage animates a contemporary or, or enduring halachic debate. That's the value added of the Magid Shir, of going to class. The lecturer right. is giving something new and innovative or, or helping to distill and um, and formulate the you know, what you saw in the primary sources and were able to prepare on your own. That's like, I would say that's between like a high level and beginners kind of Talmud education. Beginners, like the teacher is necessary to make sure you just actually understand what the words mean right. uh, in the, and, and that could be very beginners, which is like reading a Mishnah and translating it well, and then right. the Talmud and translating it well. It's hard to define that as Ian exactly. Well, it's going I mean, very slow and you're taking your time, slowly. you know, and, and versus, um, and, and then adding on layers of Rishonim, medieval and early modern commentary, um, Rishonim and Achronim. But then the class is like where the creative piece happens, where they're mm-hmm. sort of pointing things out and, and 
conceptually. So that's Ian. I say Ian doesn't have to be three hours a day. You could, you could have an hour a week and it could be an Ian shear. You're just going very slowly. And the point is not to cover breadth. The point is like to go deep and to like. Yeah, but to go to an Ian shear one hour a week, you're doing many hours of preparation. Ideally, you're doing many hours. Or the class is going very, very slow. Or the class is going very slow. You can have, you can have like, you can have, there are adult education, like shul Talmud classes, which are, the point is not let's like get through like big chunks of chunks of Talmud. The point is let's look at a few lines and see what Rashi says, see how Tosfot says. Let's, let's sort of just have a conversation about the concepts that it raises. Let's literary structure, whatever it Mm -hmm. might be. That could still be an, like, it's still definitely more Ian than Mickey The genre is but Ian. It's, it's it, not the ideal form. It's not Ian in its, in its uh, you know. It's, it's not a yeshiva style education. <laughs> but still, I would still classify that as Ian because you're going deep as opposed to. As opposed to going broad. So broad would be Bikiut. It's actually a funny word, Bikiut, because a Bucky is someone who is an expert. And Bikiut does not make for expertise necessarily. Um, and, and, and I have to say, like in my experience with Dafiumi, sometimes you turn a page and you're like, I have no idea what we talked about just now, but I'm just going to keep going. <laughs> Um, and 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 that's that's really part of the experience is just this like breadth of knowledge. I have turned in the yeshiva world. You talk about turning pages. Like I've turned every page in in Masach and uh, and it means that you've you've touched on all these different concepts. And and one of the reasons why that's actually useful and important. Well, there's two reasons, two main reasons I would say why that's useful and important. One is because the Jewish library is absolutely enormous. In a lifetime, you could not, uh, Rabbi El, uh, uh, Professor, Dr. Uh, Rabbi Yaakov Elvin wrote, oh, Elvin Shalom wrote, wrote really beautifully about like well, why he did Daf Yomi. I think there's a tablet article maybe like at the beginning of the previous cycle, I'm not really sure. You know, sort of like this beloved document that I've given my life over to study. I realized if I didn't do Daf Yomi, I would never see every page of it. Wow. Isn't that amazing? I'll yeah. send it to you. It's amazing um and then he talked about oh he does daf yomi which is seven pages on shabbos <laughs> <laughs> but um but anyways right so like just our library is so big that were you to only ever do ian for an entire lifetime you would only see a tiny yeah. fraction of it and so that's like just one reason and then the other reason is that the more you have it exposure to the more you're able to actually even like do Ian and understand things more deeply because the whole Torah is, is just like intimately connected especially I'd say especially or, the Talmud the oral Torah and, and the, Talmud, the Talmud in particular like I think that's well Torah right. mode even more than the Talmud but not Rambam, right? You know, it's right. like Rambam, you start at the beginning, you work your way to the end, and like he just lays out everything you need to know right when you need to know it, more or less, and starts mm-hmm. with basic concepts and then builds on more refined particular concepts, whereas the Talmud assumes you know the entire Talmud, every single page of the Talmud, and right. that's sort of the nature of the of the document. And so Bikiyut, that kind of breadth of learning, is so, so helpful for any time you might want to explore any topic in detail because it's going to, there will be quotations and parallel cases drawn and assumptions made about your bikiut, your mastery over the entire corpus, and that requires turning pages kind of fast and having mm-hmm. that experience. I would say even for people who are not, you know, I think, look, a lot of people who are, I'll just say to my own history, let's say, my, you know, I... Um, I was I had the great privilege of being brought to like the last three big siyumim that were that the Aguda sponsors for Daf Yomi. It's 1997. I was in high school. In 2004, I was um, in in yeshiva, and in 2012, I was uh, working uh, at Princeton. And I guess those prior cycles, I just felt like I don't know. I'm doing. I'm just have a lot of more. I felt profound Torah study in my life, and this Mm -hmm. seemed sort of too superficial to be really appealing. And since we started learning Dafyomi at the shul, so this last, I guess, two, three years, I've learned, I guess, five or six out of every seven (laughs) Dafyomi in the shul. And I I just really think it's, I just love it. And I, you know, in some ways, it's it's like you're speeding by in a train, you're looking Mm -hmm. out the window, ooh, that's kind of pretty, oh well, you know. (laughs) know, uh, But then it's like, oh, maybe I'll come back here someday. Maybe I'll come back here someday, and I hope I will. And I also feel like, you know, for somebody and I think for many people who have like really um, demanding professional responsibilities or family responsibilities or professional and family responsibilities, mm-hmm. it's a very it's a f- structure that makes sure that they still get a really um, inspiring dose of Torah in their lives each day. And I think mm-hmm. the like sense of accomplishment to finish a mesechet or to finish you know all of shas whatever it might be uh, that inspires you to okay I'm going to make sure I spend the twenty to forty minutes today but before I go to sleep tonight I'm going to make sure I learn this stuff and. Uh, and I think that that kind of sense of accomplishment, like, really um, inspires people to keep going. I, and I feel like, I don't know, like, no matter what, ha- like, 
as we're recording this, we already learned today's off. And like, no matter what else happens today, you know, it's okay. I already accomplished something really, a real like transcendent value. And, mm-hmm. and that gives me a lot of satisfaction. And I think that's also really, so even though if someone were to say to you, um, I'm going to spend 30 minutes a day studying Torah, come up with a curriculum for the next seven years. Uh, I don't know that you would say only do the Talmud for those 30 minutes a day and nothing else, right? right. I, I don't know. I think you would come up with a more broad curriculum that included some Talmud and some Mishnah and, and like and some Chumash and Halacha and philosophy. I don't know. It's like you could come up with a broader curriculum if mm-hmm. somebody were to say, I'm going to spend 30 minutes a day studying Torah, tell me what to learn. Right. But people aren't offering you that. And that's not the truth. <laughs> you know, it's really, it's Daf Yomi maybe or nothing. Not because there's nothing else to learn, but because Daf Yomi gives you that because you have. And there's the, a lot of like social reinforcement. Social reinforcement. It's like Yomi. the Weight Watchers of Torah. Is that a thing? I don't know. <laughs> the Weight Watchers of Torah study, right? maybe. <laughs> Um, other people are you're, holding, you're, you're making yourself accountable to other people who are doing it with you and right. uh, okay so I think we've talked about the what and we've talked a little bit about the why can we say more about the how sure so there's a few different like media through which one can learn Daf Yomi um, so you can basically learn it through a book learn it through a shiur learn it through a podcast um, or learn it again in the reading genre but you could learn Daf Yomi on- online by reading yeah. so uh, the books available are first of all Vilna Shas always a great option mm-hmm. for someone who can get through a full page of Vilna Shas in a day which by the way my high school Gemara Rebbe could and did sitting in very much in public so that we would all like see him and be inspired by it <laughs> um, but also like art scroll and Koran and um and art scroll even makes these like tiny little very thin like floppy um you know for every masachet there's like 15 of them um there's someone in the show who uses them i can point them out to you if you are interested in acquiring this set if you want to read but you want to do it on the go that could be a good option um in terms of podcasts there's a lot of really good ones um are so name three or four that you okay. think are yeah so the first one that i'm really excited about is it's called daf yomi four with a digit women by Benit Michelle Cohn Farber. Um, why I'm so excited about it is, first of all, that she's completing Shas with this cycle um, in terms of her podcast, and I think this podcast constitutes the first um, commentary by a woman on the entirety of Shas, which is just like an enormous transcendent achievement. Um, and um, obviously, it's not written, but hopefully, in the future, it will be written. I would say also most commentaries on Shas were first transmitted orally and then transcribed by students, so this one um, should be no different than that um so just like really really excited about that um the other thing i happen to like about it is that classically like even rashi does this where like if you have to give an example of a concept it'll be who are the who are the characters like reuven threw a stone at shimon um and her examples are leia threw a stone at rachel um which is which is just like ex- you know fun and different and exciting um and um so and, i like as she and and, and this not to digress too much but mm-hmm. she is organizing this massive uh, see them, I guess, mostly by and for women. I think it's, I guess, men are invited as well. Men are invited, it's, yeah. It's in Binyin Ha'uma in Jerusalem, which is a... Huge. Like, there are going to be 3,000 women there, or people there. I don't know. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and and a lot of, by the way, like, all of the most, like, inspirational, learned women of our generation are going to be there teaching, like, from America. It's actually very few from America, but I know uh, Dr. Erica Brown will be there, and I think she's making a Siyama Shas also. She is, yeah, yeah. Yeah, which is just, you know, fabulous and um, one of my childhood role models. Um, so I'm very, very excited about that it's, 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 it's interesting i think I, I had a conversation with her i guess about 10 more than 10 years ago in which she expressed um the sense that like all the time she put into writing her dissertation like she could have learned shas so she completed her dissertation and, and now, now she's, she's learning shas, shas. So i feel like amazing. which is like really great <laughs> she's just like the coolest person by the way if you're not like following her on twitter and like whatever reading her books like strong recommend dr erica brown She's also like an artist. It's really she's amazing. Um. Anyways, uh, okay. So that's that's uh, Daf for women. A very very popular one is Rabbi Et Shalom. Um. He's very quick also, but I think quick and understandable. Yeah, I'd say I think that's one of the one of the, like I guess those are the two really appealing things about his Daf Yomi. She's very to the point and uh, and and just clear and. Uh, doesn't you know no 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 frills no bells and whistles and therefore he can do a daf in about twenty minutes and which you, is crazy which is, yeah. which is great and but it's, <laughs> but it's like. I like and him. if you listen to it on double speed, then it's 10 minutes. Oh, my gosh. That I can't even imagine. The brain can process the information that fast. But he's, he's great. People really like him. Yeah. So people really like him. Um, another one that we should just mention is that um, our Rebbe, Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Linzer, um, has, I think, a full shot, at least, yeah. Yeah. in podcasts. Those are also all available. Um, he didn't, like, do this full cycle, but he he has a full cycle on there. I know um, that there was a, a man in the community I grew up in who taught at Cornell, and he would be driving often from Boston to Cornell, which is 
about a six hour drive. I think he learned almost all of Shas from Rabbi Linzer during those drives back and oh, forth. Wow. That's yeah, great. which is kind of amazing, right? So it's just like if you have a lot of time in the car, you can think about like the prospect of learning all of Shas, <laughs> um, which is really cool while you're driving. Um, so you cannot read that. That's that's why oh, no, a podcast is a great option. Um, and then the last one I think we should mention is Rabbi Elephant. Yeah, yeah. Elephant is one of the people the OU has teaching Daf Yomi Shirim. I don't know if he's still doing it live or just he's done it so many times to just have all of his uh, Shirim recorded. There was a, uh, a member of the shul who sadly passed away a few years ago, but he learned Daf Yomi and he learned with Rabbi Elephants, uh, listened to his, I think he learned by on his own with an art school Gemara, and then he would listen again to Rabbi Elephant. And he said to me, uh, you know, if I haven't uh, heard Rabbi Elephant's Shirim, I have not yet learned the Daf, it doesn't count. <laughs> and, and I, since he died, I actually saw Rabbi Elephants at a conference and I said, like, you had a Talmud in, in our shul who like really, mm-hmm. and, and it meant a lot to him because he, I guess, you know, he it's does, a huge amount of he's, work. he's the COO of OU Kashrut, so yeah. he, his job is like not with like live students, you know, mm-hmm. like mostly. Uh, it's an administrative role and a halachic policy role. But I was going to say, and those episodes of Halacha Headlines where he appears talking about Kashrut, he is so impressive. Like just the whole organization that he describes is like, it really made me like only want to eat OU food. <laughs> <laughs> but so, so I think it, it meant a lot to him to know that he actually here was like a, like a Jew like who goes to shul, who like, you know, part of, you know, who, who like, who felt that he was a teacher of his. It meant a lot to him to hear that. And the OU is actually uh, like ramping up their Daf um Offerings? Offerings, yeah. The, the latest edition of Jewish Action Magazine, that's their like magazine for, they sent to shuls and to, you know, et cetera, to like the general public mm-hmm. has like a whole feature about like their new Daf Yomi offerings through their website, through a, cool. through an, an app. And so they're, they're going to have like more and different and diverse like resources for cool. learning Daf Yomi and then like extra things for people who learn Daf Yomi. So if you learn the Daf, like there are, you know, what are the halachic, you know, topics that are raised by the Daf and like learn more about that, et cetera. That's cool. You know? um, My Jewish Learning is also going to start doing uh, Daf Yomi stuff and they're going to have like this very diverse, because that's like an interdenominational or whatever. So they're going to have very diverse offerings. I'm writing one for Brachot. Yeah, cool. um, and every day they're just going to send out like 300 words oh, on, wow. the, you know, riffing off the off that day's Daf. So that's another um, just fun like plus yeah. thing that, that you can subscribe to. Um, okay, so that's to listen. We talked about reading um, out of a book. You can come to our shir. <laughs> we teach Daf Yomi almost every day. I mean, if there's a bris or something, it gets in the way. So then we don't, unfortunately, now. Um, but maybe if there was like more pressure to <laughs> persevere, even when there's stuff going on in the show, we might. Um, and you're going to start teaching maybe on... Uh, and I, My plan is Shabbos to start morning. Shabbos morning at not at 8.20. So uh, finishing in time for Shachrit at 9. But uh, the... Um... So the other day, we mean after weekday shachrit on Sunday through thir- through Friday, and then Shabbat morning at eight twenty. So that'll be. Uh, and the added bonus will be that you can um, then be at shul on time. Exactly. If you, <laughs> you, if you are one of the, you know, two hundred and ninety five members of Hanshei Shalom who struggle to get to shul right at, when it starts, <laughs> this will be a great way. And if you listen to a podcast, you can't listen to the podcast on Shabbos. Right. So even if you don't come to us during the week, coming on Shabbos might be a great and option. Even to if keep you up. don't, I would say even if you don't learn Daf during the week, like if you do, I, look, it's better if you could do at least two days or three days consecutively, so you get some of the because like the topics don't like start and stop with the Daf. But yeah. but yeah, no, I think the more you the more you get out of it, the more you put in, the more you get out of it. And even if it's even if you got to come for one day, you'll be a little bit lost some weeks. But some weeks you'll be there for like really inspiring, amazing things. And some weeks and you'll, start, you'll you know, learn one more Daf Gemara than you were otherwise. Correct. correct. So, so I would say if, you can, if your itself. schedule allows you just to come on Sunday or maybe just Shabbos and Sunday mornings, then you get like two consecutive days, which maybe can contain a coherent idea, yeah. right? <laughs> uh, but between the two of them combined. So I, I think that would be a really, really worthwhile endeavor. Um, so that's, okay. So that's in person. Yeah. And then the last thing we should just say is that a full translation of the Talmud is available on Safaria. Um, and so, again, not a great Shabbos option. So, again, come to the Shia Shabbos morning. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, but if you, again, if you're someone who learns on the go and doesn't want to schlep a book, so um, you can learn on Safaria. The one thing I would say is that um, Art Scroll and um, the like the published books of Art Scroll and Koran have like pictures and maps and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And none of that, you'll, you won't get any of that. Um, on Safaria. Excitingly, Safaria did just add um, Nikudot to their entire Hebrew Talmud, um, which for me, I find that very helpful. Um, Nikudot and like... The vowels of vocalization. Vowels and, and, right, vowels, vocalization, also like apostrophe, you know, commas and exclamation points. Like when I, when I learn out of Vilna Shas, that's like the first thing I do is try and figure out like where do the periods go? Where does, where does the exclamation point go? Yeah, I saw, I saw the announcement. It's interesting that they they reference Dicta, which is a really interesting um, like digital humanities kind of software company in Israel, it's not. They didn't. They didn't. Um, 
They didn't have someone sit down and go through and put in every point. Right. They, they taught a computer the grammar of Babylonian Aramaic, and then the computer figured it out, which is a pretty cool... Uh, which is awesome, yeah. yeah. Which also means, like, you shouldn't necessarily, like, if you're like, oh, I never knew that, like... It could be like you shouldn't necessarily make chidushim based off of the. Could be a mistake, but it could be maybe the computer's <laughs> right. I don't know. That's, that's, uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyways, totally. Um, so, anyways, there's lots of different ways to learn daf yomi. One could, if you want to say, I want to make a seven and a half year commitment, you can buy now a subscription to get a new book every, however, every masachet for the next seven and a half years, and that's a great um, commitment device. However, if you don't know what your learning mode is going to be, try you don't for, yeah. have to do that, yeah. and you could try listening yeah. to a podcast six days a week or you could whatever you know try out different things see what fits best into your lifestyle and the best for your style of learning yeah. I, I would say they're probably going to be discounts like leading up to the end of this cycle the start of the new cycle so if you are able to i know corinne is having like pretty substantial discounts to people willing to order the entire set right now of their mm-hmm. the corinne stein so style it's a great thing to have in the house like buy a new bookshelf also you buy a new bookshelf <laughs> no, it's not, it's only, whatever it's not that <laughs> they're you know uh they look very pretty on the shelf also you know in addition yeah. to being like very like important tools of Torah scholarship mm-hmm. um, but they're offering very significant discounts they're also offering if you, if you do buy a set anyone listening if you tell them the shul that you go to uh, they give a $250 credit to the shul to purchase Farim. and uh, we are going to be purchasing so, so, yeah. so, so, so if you, anyone listening if you're like on the fence about buying now or, or waiting a few months you know mm-hmm. uh, obviously like make sure it's something that you want it's, you know, make sure you can afford it make sure it's a responsible choice for given the your, the state of your bookcases right now but uh, if you do make sure you let know which you go to if that's the choice that you that works best for you so we can get that credit two other like Anshe Shalom specific things about Daf Yumi I just want to mention one is that with the new cycle we're going to be starting a, a WhatsApp group called called ASBI Daf Chatter. Um, so it'll connect all the people in our show who are learning in all these different ways um, where people can ask questions maybe or be like, didn't you guys think this was cool? Or I've composed a haiku about today's Daf. Here it is. Um, or share resources or things like that. Um, so that is going to exist. That's number one. And then two is that on January 5th, even if you're not learning the Daf, you can totally come to this. It's a Sunday. We're going to be starting the first page of Brachut. Um, there's going to be breakfast. That's going to be really nice. Um, and you should definitely try and come. Bli Neder, I might be making a Siyama Nida also, and maybe some other people too. Um, so just it'll be an exciting morning. So definitely join us also. So on um, on January fifth for that, and the last thing I just want to say is like um, any uh, Bikute style learning project is good. Any anything that gets you learning every single day is a really is a really good or every single week or whatever it is like more learning better than less learning. So I just wanted to throw out there a few other. Um, I came to Dafiumi. I mean, what does it mean late in life when you're in your twenties? But but like Dafiumi was not my first Bikute style learning project. Um, when I was in yeshiva for the year after high school, I learned through all of Tanakh in a year. Um, that comes out to five chapters a day for anyone interested, and that was amazing. And my Tanakh is full of notes, and I've. Told Turned every again, turning pages. Like turn every page in the Tanakh, which is you, you could go to D school, like kindergarten through twelfth grade, and there are entire books of Tanakh that you have never opened. And that, by the way, the Bavli, just because we're like in Bavli land, Bavli assumes you know all of it by heart, and it'll reference one word, and that's supposed to hyperlink in your brain to the entire chapter. like s- chapter that it's talking about. Right. Um, so, meaning to to start with the Bavli when you haven't read Tanakh, there's something uh, within the world of the Bavli that's backwards about that, because their assumption is this is the primary book, you know it by heart, and now you can move on to these discussions, um, and um, so that, I think, is a great one, a great way to learn that if you want to be part of, like, an international book club on Tanakh, is called 929, because there's 929 chapters in Tanakh. Um, 929 is both, was started in Israel um, and has moved due to some of my teachers, specifically Rabbi Adam Mintz and um, Shira Hacht Kohler, to America. And they have fabulous resources on there, some of them written by members of our show. My husband's written for them. Um, Binyami Cohen, our, our uh, VP for Education, has written for them. I've written for them. Um, and they have great English language like resources on every day's chapter. Right. So it's also another nice thing about 929, which I feel like, you know, if, if you could go back in time and say this to Rav Meir Shapiro, maybe he would have adopted this for Daf Yomi also. It's only five days a week. <laughs> it's five days a week. So you have five days a week, and then that gives you Shabbos to catch up, or it gives you Shabbos to, like, study more and review. And it's like, it's, you know, mm-hmm. and that's, which is, I think, like, a very nice way to, like, kind of organize things. And you get through the 929 chapters in a couple of years. And it's, uh, yeah. And that's, they've done this is now, they're in their second, second cycle. Second they're round, midway right. through their second cycle. But, they're still, you know, they're still in a lot of. The, they're in Isaiah now. They, yeah. yeah, they're in Isaiah. There's a lot so of good stuff still to go. A lot of still, like Isaiah is a great book if you, you know, and and lots of great books yet to come. That probably the ones that 
I would say the ones that we ha- that 929 has not yet gotten up to are probably those books that you're referring to that that <laughs> even fairly learned at you know Jews with great day school and yeshiva educations have not yet opened. Open. Yeah, so those yeah. are yet to come in the 929 cycle. Um, the other great um, like Bikias like Torah cycle is we alluded to it before. The ancient one is the weekly Torah portion, which uh, is kind of, is nice that we have seven aliyot on Shabbat, which correspond very nicely to the seven days of the week. So mm-hmm. on uh, Sunday, the first day of the week, you could read through like the entire first Aliyah. And on Monday, you could read through the second Aliyah. And in that way, when you get to Shul Shabbat morning, you've already seen the whole Parsha at least once, at least, you know, in a, in a quick way. And then when you're listening to it read, you know what to expect, you know what's happening, and you can, have, I think, hear it in a much deeper way. Absolutely. And the traditional way of doing it, it's called um, Shnai Mekrach and uh, Which means? Which means reading the verses twice and translation once. What they mean there by Targum is Targum Angulus. Um, if the you want ancient it, Aramaic translation of the Right, which term. is the, ta- the Talmud says is like prophetically inspired. And there's all sorts of amazing, and in Avodazar, there's all these amazing stories about Angulus, the human. Um, and, and, and see you there. Um, the eponymous but, author of yes, of <laughs> Uglis, Unless you're trying to improve your Aramaic, which by the way, I think I think Ethan maybe was doing this for a while, was like trying to improve his Aramaic by reading Uglis and then also Septuagint yeah. for Greek. Um, oh, but if that's not like your speed necessarily, um, an English translation would be great, or a commentator would be a great I think, addition. I think, Mendel, I think Mendelssohn wrote his. Somebody listening to this knows if I'm right or wrong. I think Mendelssohn wrote his <laughs> translation of the Torah into German as a way to help. Jews learn German. I think like that, that the idea That's that awesome. you would like learn a language by reading the Torah in that language is like a, like a very old way that I guess Jews who like like the Torah can learn a foreign language. So all right, so. scholars, let us know if we're <laughs> right or wrong. Um, I look forward to hearing from you. Um, and uh, yeah, that's cool. Right. So um, so anyway, so that's a good another really good one. And then the last one I'll just mention, which some people, including children in our shell, are currently doing, um, are learning Mishnayot. Um, and that's another great BQ project. And especially because um, learning Mishnah gives you exposure to kind of all of the major terms and concepts that you'll then see anywhere else in your learning. Um, and, and it'll give you the exact language for it, meaning sometimes there are there is language that appears in the Mishnah that it has its roots in the Torah, but the Torah uses actually a different word. Um, and so if all you know is the Torah, then when you see it in the Bavli, you might not even recognize it until you're like, oh, that's just like a different iteration of that thing in Parshat Kitisa or whatever it is, right? Whereas if you learn it in the Mishnah, you, then that's where the terminology that kind of is the backbone of all of the rest of the oral law comes from. Um, Mishnah is a little bit hard to learn. You can't just pick up Mishnah and read it straight because, again, it assumes you know every other concept. But there um, are lots of like excellent, excellent commentaries. Um, basic, simple, clarifying commentaries on the Mishnah, including in English. Kahati, Kahati was a... Do you know how the Kahati... He was a bank teller. Do you know how, the, you know how it was originally published? Not in book form. It was a daily Mishnah column in a newspaper. Wow, that's amazing. Which it's exactly how Kahati... Because you could read one Mishnah in Kahati and you'll get... He has... He'll provide just enough background information to understand it, even if you know just about nothing. Mm -hmm. And it'll take you five to ten minutes to learn one Mishnah. And, like, that's a wonderful, wonderful learning project. It's a great way to learn the Mishnah. And a child can do it, too. Like, it really... Like, Mm -hmm. I I think in our... uh, In our family, I think... If I remember... I think our children started learning Mishnah in maybe third or fourth grade, um, mm-hmm. with uh, mostly with their mother, sometimes with me, and, 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 and they've, like, all, like, I guess once they reach that age, the ones who reach that age have completed a number of tractates of Mishnah, and it's a great excuse for a party, and it's to reinforce that mm-hmm. sense that Torah learning is something special, and yeah. there are others in the community who do that as well, and I think it's a great, great, again, way to both, like, like the education itself, the content is really helpful for future Torah scholarship, and the, like, values that you're sharing when you celebrate a child's Torah accomplishments is also really great. Yeah, and adults might get something out of it too. Even if you've learned the Mishnah before, you review it and oh, you totally, get, you totally, know. totally, totally, of course. Um, yeah. So, uh, so that yeah, and we're happy also to advise on where to start in the Mishnah. You don't need to start at the beginning and move through. In fact, I wouldn't necessarily. Meaning, bracha great, but paya no. is hard yeah. um, unless you have really good spatial skills. Uh, yeah, I would say so. yeah, for anyone who's <laughs> beginning Mishnah, there's no reason. I, don't, I, I, I have every reason to do the easier ones first or the more relevant, directly relevant ones first. I think that's you know like good that yeah. And, and just to follow your interest. Also, like when I was um, at, for my bat mitzvah, I learned Yoma with my mom. But that's because at that time I was obsessed with sacrifices. Like animal sacrifices were like my jam when I was 11. Um, whatever. That is so interesting. And very strange. But she was like, great, this is what you're interested in. Fine, let's 
that's like learn Yoma. Um, so it still has like this big place in my heart. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, Yoma, I mean, we're, we're learning the eighth parak of Yoma with our Mishmar students, and it's that's like, it's not about animal not sacrifices, about animal but sacrifices. incredibly, incredibly rich, interesting things about uh, life saving, overriding Shabbat, and and mm-hmm. eating on Yom, who gets to eat on Yom Kippur, and why, and how. Like very, very interesting uh, material there in Yoma. Yeah. Um, so anyways, lots of good stuff in the Mishnah, lots of opportunities for learning in general. And if you want to pick up a learning opportunity and none of those things speak to you, oh, I should mention one other one, which is we've talked a lot about the Rabbam. Um, people also learn the Mishnah Torah start to finish. Um, and that I actually do recommend starting at the beginning. Yeah. But I mean, whatever. Like that you don't is have the, the to. great advantage of the Rambam is that he... <laughs> Uh, it's meant to be learned in order. Yeah, that, that was his genius. So that he took the Talmud. was like, oh, like this is a mess. Let me like reorganize this yeah. in a conceptual way. That like, yeah. Um, so that that's a great point. And I think Chabad is really into that. I think they yeah, they do the, every um, day. Yeah. The Chabad learns every day. Um, yeah. Uh, Mishnah Torah and um, and it's it's just like very very clear and you'll again get exposure to all these concepts. I would say the Rambam doesn't in at least in, in an Ashkenazi community he doesn't always win halachically so I wouldn't like read it and then live your life by it unless you're Yemenite. Um, <laughs> but um, you've not yet had any downloads of the podcast in Yemen, so I... so I don't know. Well, yeah, okay. Anyways, but I'm sure we have some, a, a Yemenite listener or two. Um, but um, so if that's you, then for sure you should be learning Mishnah Torah all the time. The Yemenites are already they're already learning. They know it already by heart. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, but anyways, you know, if you're looking for something for another like halachic thing, uh, if you're looking for Hasidus, like whatever it is, like we're happy to also have those conversations have these to conversations come up with projects that, that would. Come these projects yeah. exactly um so just like all the torah the better but also we're really loving our daf yomi learning right now um and there's an opportunity to start that again on january 5th with us hopefully there'll be some bagels and that will be lovely and exciting so um yeah come and join and come learn with us okay so um we're so grateful that our guest today, Carolyn Musin Berkowitz, has joined us. And um, we're here today specifically because um, Carolyn is one of the people in our show who has been learning Dafyomi pretty regularly. For how long? When did you start? Um, almost two years ago. Almost two years ago. So you're not finishing a whole cycle this year. Correct. What what um, Masachet did you start with? I started with Avoda Zara. Oh, that's a good place to start. Did you learn some things about what not to do? Um, I learned many things about what (laughs) not to do. If you see something on the ground in front of a statue, you should not bend down. And If you see money, you should not bend down and pick it up because people might think that you are worshipping the statue. And do you worship statues? Not usually. Oh, that's good. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, Amazing. And um, can you tell us just like what has it been like for you to learn that for the last two years? It has been an eye-opening experience. It's been interesting to see so many things sprinkled here and there that are things I recognize from my regular Jewish life and to say, oh, oh, wait, there's a basis for this. Oh, it mm. comes from somewhere. Mm-hmm. So that's been that's been a really exciting thing. Also seeing the words that I know from the Sidur and from Jewish life. I remember the first word that I saw that I really knew um, was afilu, um, which means even. But most of us probably know it as afilu pa'amachat from the Haggadah. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that was my first recognition. Oh, these are my words too. So that mm-hmm. was, it's been a very interesting experience of, of claiming this piece um, of Judaism that I didn't think I had access to because I didn't have a yeshiva education. But in fact, I do and you do, and, and any of us can. And that's what I think is most exciting about Dafyomi. So what are the tools that you use in order to gain access to this text? Because the Talmud is not written in English and like clear language. It doesn't even have punctuation. Correct. So I use the Koran Talmud Bavli, um, which has an English edition. Um, it's English and Hebrew and Aramaic side by side. And it's what the shul uses in the daf yomi shiur. Mm-hmm. And I find it to be extremely helpful to follow along phrase by phrase. So I read on my own and I listen to podcasts. Mm. Um, there are a few different ones that I listen to. Um, not f- just the straw hat. Not just the... <laughs> Strangely, <laughs> I do listen to a few more podcasts than that. I thought you just listened to them on repeat until the new one comes out. Shh. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> They're good. Thanks, thanks. <laughs> um, I really like Daf Yomi for women, um, which, just so you know, is not only about women or a view for women, but it's a podcast by Rabbanit Michelle Cohen Farber, who teaches a group of women in her home every day. In Ranana. In Ranana. And then she and she records it and she posts it on the internet. And so I listen 
um, during and the, my commute. The time or lag works out very well for America. When I wake up, it's right there in my podcast feed. It's really helpful. Yeah. Um, so I do that. I get an email every day from another rabbi who does a haiku on the daf. Um, there are just different things out there. And then I have some friends who are learning who I might text and say, hey, what's this interesting thing? We'll talk about it. And um, I also share on Instagram the, the weird things, the quirky things. Um, my account is called hashtag Dafyomi because that's how I was describing things at first on Facebook. And I, I'm not really looking for the scholarly things. I'm looking for the very odd and interesting things that surprise me and that delight me or disturb me, depending mm-hmm. Totally. Yeah, I think one of like the best things about the Talmud is if you were just to say, oh, it's this law code. I think that would barely scratch the surface of actually what the Talmud is. It's like this combination of Jewish law and lore and like just rabbis being like cool, awesome, funny, interesting people. And they insult each other. Yes. Which is, you know, not what I was expecting. In They seem very real. They talk about real life issues. Um, they talk about very mundane issues. It, I just find it fascinating. One of my favorite things was one rabbi said to the other, well, while you were eating dates in Babylonia, some of us were in Israel doing things and learning things. <laughs> um, yeah, that was a good moment. And I was like, that's some shade. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> totally. Right. One of the, there's like a theme throughout the Talmud of, of the rabbis in Israel and the rabbis in Babylonia, like learning from each other, but also like really going after each other. <laughs> yes. Um, and I just, I find that to be, very interesting and refreshing because I didn't expect it. Mm. And it's not so different from the discourse that sometimes we have in oh, these we days. We like to think we're the first generation of Jews who didn't like each other. <laughs> right, right. Um, and then, of course, there's the fact that they're not necessarily talking to each other so much as past each other mm-hmm. across generations, um, which is also fascinating. Um, just the way everything was put together is really fascinating. And I just, I love learning these weird and different things or at some point this summer I read this whole section about when we say a full hallel Mm -hmm. and and on which holidays we don't and why and Erchen yeah yes and and the the argument just kept spinning out well because these things happened in Eretz Israel but wait this didn't happen in Eretz Israel Mm. but here's why it is okay and here's why it's not okay and it was fascinating it was yeah. just it's just interesting to see the logic spinning in circles and and creating a web of understanding. But I love that there's no section of the Talmud that's just like purely practical, useful, familiar to us. Like even you'll open up Masachet Shabbat, Masachet Psachim, like um, which you think like I keep Pesach, I keep Shabbat, but they're still full of these like amazing kind of somewhat foreign things interspersed with, oh, that's why we do that. Or like, that's why it's familiar. Like you're, you're never like fully in a familiar world in the Talmud, I feel. I would agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, okay, so I have a different question for you about Dafyomi. Um, one of the things that sometimes turns people off from Dafyomi is just the the, the enormity of the commitment. Um, and you are a person with a very full life in addition to your Daf. So meaning you're a parent and you have a full-time job and you like, I don't know, somehow put food on the table for your family and all of that. Um, how do you balance it all? Like how And where does the Daf fit into that day? Well, when I do the daf in the morning, it works better than when I do the daf at night after my kids are in bed because <laughs> I'm exhausted too. Um, I, For me, it's like self-care. It's mm. me time. It's a focus on something different. And in a world where we all spend too much time with our screens, mm-hmm. it's time that I spend largely separate from my screen um, or screens. So I really like that. It's it's an opportunity for me to do something intellectual. I read a lot, but I don't necessarily read intellect, deeply intellectual things except for the Talmud for 35 or 40 minutes every day. Yeah. So it fits in. I find ways. If you, you know, if you commute on a bus, it's a great place to do the DAF, mm. um, as I did last week when I had to be downtown for a seminar. If you drive, listening to a podcast on the DAF is something that you can do it's great while washing dishes or folding laundry Mm. um if you look around there are ways to fit it into your life i am in awe of the people who are really doing it every single day i will tell you sometimes my day is busy sometimes i can't quite get to it or can't quite finish it and i will catch up the next day 
because that's real life. Mm -hmm. Um, But I don't skip days, if Mm -hmm. that makes sense. I'm always skip pages. I don't skip pages. I don't skip content, Mm -hmm. even if sometimes things happen. But my Gamara has come with me to New York. It's come with me to Arizona. It's come with me um, to work. Not during work, (laughs) but like during lunch breaks or when I get there early. It comes with me wherever I go. I have a very um, large bag that I carry that it fits in. (laughs) That was an important logistical consideration. It it just goes with me because wherever I am, if I have time in a waiting room, in the dentist's office, uh, in the waiting room, um, (laughs) it's something that um, I have ready for me. Yeah. That's amazing. And, and I think a lot of people kind of, that's a big concern for them of like, I can't keep up. It's too big of a commitment. And the answer is you can squeeze it into your life and all of these different, I loved what you said about um, the different like media through which you can learn the DAF. Like if you're driving, obviously you're not going to sit there with like the DAF projected onto your windshield. Right. Like that seems like a poor right. idea, um, but you could listen to it or you can, you, like there's all these different ways to keep up. I will also say if you don't want to carry a Gemara around with you as you go about your way. The entire Talmud is on Safari. Mm-hmm. I have stood in line at the post office going through the DAF while waiting in a seemingly interminable interminable oh, line. Um, and it's a good way to use that time yeah. and to find the pockets of time um, in our lives. That's amazing. Um, so I just want to like pivot for a second away from DAF Yomi, just whenever we have guests on the podcast, we like to ask them a few questions about just like the shawl and the various roles they might play within the shawl. And if someone wanted to meet you after listening to this inspiring interview, where might they find you? Um, things like that. Well, I've been part of the shawl community for um, about 14 years. Wow. Um, I so basically, if you don't know Carolyn yet, you're not right. doing it right. <laughs> I mean, I don't know everyone. Um, I came to this neighborhood after I finished graduate school. And I'm in shul pretty much every single week, and I sit in the far back corner of the women's section near the door to the restroom and the playroom. And I am involved on the mikvah committee, Mm -hmm. and I was previously, when my children were younger, a Tat Shabbat leader. And um, you're also on the family committee, and I'm on the family programming committee. Yes, yes, that that as well. Um, and uh, we're so grateful for everything that you do for the show. I'd also say if you want to find Caroline with her dafiomi and that seat near the back of the women's section, I'm the one with the pink Kamara. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I would say that is the a number one criticism that people have of that Steinzaltz English is that the the cases um, tear very the, quickly. The cases tear quickly. So I got myself um, a hot pink book cover and I love it. And that's what I use. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for coming in and doing this interview with us. Um, and everyone should definitely consider learning Dafiomi when it starts again in January. I hope you'll join me. Glad to answer any of your questions. And also schmooze about the Daf, obviously. Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks for coming in. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Straw Hat. Thank you, as always, to our producer, Haley Leventhal, for keeping us on track and making sure these episodes come out in such a timely and well-edited way. Um, If you loved this episode or have any questions or comments um, or positive feedback, please send it to us by email, voice note. We're happy to talk to you in Shalon Shabbos, all of those things. And if you have um, negative feedback, you can stick it into your um, menorah and then light it. And maybe the smoke signal from that will, will reach us. Have a wonderful day. Thanks for listening.